I am Shanti Fry, your moderator today. And before I introduce our experts, I'd like you to keep two sets of numbers in mind. The first is the number of people who are affected by learning disabilities. One in 16 students are identified by their school systems as needing some form of special education. That's 2.3 million students. But that's only part of the story because one in five Americans are actually affected by learning disabilities. The second set of numbers I'd like you to keep in mind has to do with the costs that are associated with learning disabilities. Annually, approximately $30 billion is allocated by a combination of the federal government and state governments to address lear special learning issues. But that's only part of the story. 1.2 million students repeat a grade every year. That's an additional cost of $9 billion. And on top of that, we know that children who start out with learning disabilities are more likely to have encounters with the criminal justice system. Approxim approximately 55% of people with learning disabilities end up with something that's worse than a traffic ticket. There are also situations that really impact our national health care expenditures. Again, people with learning disabilities that are not addressed are at higher risk for incurring higher medical costs. And this doesn't even count the amount of money that parents spend out of their own pockets. There are compelling public policy reasons for addressing learning issues with some forms of neurofeedback and other types of non-invasive brain stimulation. But that's not really even the most important cost. The most important cost is the cost of human suffering. For 17 years, I was the head of an adoption support group that at its height numbered 1,000 families. I heard story after story about children with learning dis disabilities. Those parents, like me, um, tried many conventional approaches, um, you know, pharmaceuticals, intensive tutoring, therapeutic approaches to their children's problems. My own daughter, at the end of fourth grade, could not read, could not write, and could not do arithmetic. To give you an example of how seriously I took this, when she was in second grade, I took her to intensive tutoring four hours a day, four days a week, for seven months. Nothing worked until I took her to neurofeedback with one of the speakers we have today. After six weeks, she picked up a book on her own. I'm gonna cry, it was so incredible. 3,000 pages she read that summer at grade level fiction. Of course, I started directing other adoptive parents to neurofeedback, as you can imagine, I was thrilled. And these are examples of some of the things I saw. A child who would not look anyone in the face, suddenly shaking hands and sharing a joke with others. A child um, in the ninth grade, her geometry grade went from a C to an A in one semester without any other kind of intervention. A child who was in a very structured special education school and had been for years, she had such a terrible time learning. One day when she was doing for neurofeedback, she was given this simple homework assignment, go home and draw a picture of her, your house. She came back with a blueprint-like plan of her house. Another child who in sixth grade, her working memory was so faulty that she could not get a complete sentence down on a paper. She could utter it, but she couldn't hold on to it long enough to actually put it down on a piece of paper. She's about to graduate with a degree in engineering from college. And finally, my own daughter was able to successfully take calculus in high school and is now at a top 15 university. It is not only suffering of children that drives parents to neurofeedback. It is also our two speakers today. Dr. Lawrence Hirschberg and Dr. Naomi Steiner came from excellent academic backgrounds and affiliations with major teaching hospitals. But they were frustrated also by the limitations of what they could do for the people who came to them for help. 
which is what eventually turned them to looking at neurofeedback. Dr. Hirschberg uh, has a PhD in psychology from the outstanding program that is offered by the University of Michigan. He is a clinical associate professor at Brown Medical School, where he is co-leading a study about treatment in ADHD. He is the head of the Neurodevelopment Center in Providence, Rhode Island. He's going to talk to you about the kinds of conditions that neurofeedback can help. It's quite a large range of conditions. Dr. Steiner got her medical education from the world-renowned University of Zurich. She then completed her training at teaching hospitals affiliated with NYU, the University of Florida, and BU Medical School. She has returned to BU Medical School as a member of the faculty after 10 years with Tufts Medical Center. But more importantly for our purposes today, she is the principal investigator on several studies, including one about ADHD in schools. Um, one of the things that she has done, which is so remarkable, is she's been able to take these treatments outside of a purely clinical setting and put them in a non-clinical setting, which is a school, and achieve results that have been highly beneficial to children suffering from ADHD. Because we have a lot of material to cover today, I'm going to ask you to hold your questions to the end. We will have adequate time to address all of your concerns because right after this, it's lunch. So <laughs> Q&A period goes a little over, you can do that. And also, if you have very specific questions that you might not want to ask in front of everyone else, I know our speakers will be kind enough to talk to you about that. It is now my honor to introduce uh, and ask to start to speak Dr. Hirschberg, who will be followed by Dr. Steiner, um, to tell you about the benefits to children their families, and to society, which will benefit by having human beings that have really and truly reached their full potential. My job is to sort of provide the groundwork about what neurofeedback is, how it works, and the research showing its um, effectiveness as a treatment for a whole range of conditions. And then Naomi is going to speak more specifically about ADHD. Um, and I want to start, though, with a story. Shanti had a number of great stories. I, I often forget about um, some of those results. But this is another one. And this was a young boy named Tristan. And he was five years old when he came to us. He was diagnosed both by us and by previous clinicians with PTSD. He had repeatedly witnessed his father, his father brutally um, violent with his mother. She finally left, uh, got out, got safe, brought him for play therapy to a child therapist who was an expert specifically in working with kids in trauma. Um, but he could not tolerate any kind of engagement with her. Uh, she did not try to get him to talk about anything. He just could not be in a room. And he repeatedly tantrumed, and literally, she told me, pulled every book out of her bookshelf. So we did 30, we did 20 30 minute sessions of neurofeedback. Before we start with anyone, we measure their symptom severity using well established, it's usually simple rating scales. Um, and then after 20 sessions with everybody, we repeat those same rating scales so we can actually measure as best you can measure him change. And so, and he, during this time when he was uh, getting neurofeedback, so we're talking about 10 weeks in this boy's life, he had no other, no other new form of treatment. Okay. So here you see the Connors teacher rating scale, and I'm presenting the teacher's reports since... Of course, this mom desperately wanted her boy to get better, and that kind of um, that kind of wish that a person has can easily lead them to see it being better when it isn't necessarily as, uh, as so much better, less so a little bit less so with teachers, and so this is the the Connors teachers rating scale. This is an older version than the current one. Um, the green bar is showing his baseline scores. The blue bar is showing his scores after 10 weeks. The, uh, the way this scale works is, is that anything 65 or above is considered to indicate a significant 
clinical level problem between 60 and 65 would be considered at risk or not quite so much of a problem and anything below 60 is considered within normal limits. So you can see he's got some pretty significant elevations there, um, especially all the way on the right, oppositional behavior, but also aggression is pretty high, the total score is pretty high, and so on. So this was a guy who was struggling and these measures show it, but you can see that after 20 sessions, things are looking dramatically different. So to, to take a boy with the intense difficulties that he has and in 10 weeks time see these kinds of changes, um, you don't usually see. One year later, so he had no further treatment. One year later, his mom e emailed me and this is what she had to say. He was, Tristan's teacher told him that he was a fabulous kid. She said apparently he didn't know him a year ago. Uh, he was at the top of his class in terms of his academics. He was smart. He was a pleasure to have in her class. So that was after 10 weeks of treatment, one year later, with no other treatment intervening. So what we do with neurofeedback is we, uh, we train a person to alter their EEG. And so it's critical to understand what the heck the EEG is telling us, what it's all about, what it's a signal of. And everybody knows that you get an EEG if your doctor is concerned about seizure disorders, that's its uh, seizures, that's its main medical use, but actually it's a form of functional neuroimaging. So the EEG is telling you about activity levels, how active pools of neurons are in the brain. And um, Literally, this occurs within milliseconds, so it's very accurate in the time domain. The speed of the EEG is telling you about how active these pools of neurons are that are contributing to the signal. And this has been well validated using other measures of, of brain activity, especially, for instance, cortical blood flow. So how do you measure the speed of the EEG? It's pretty simple. You just look at the number of times when the waveforms is going up and down, the, time, the number of times it goes from one peak to another peak in one second's time. So the red line there is representing one second. And if you look at that bottom trace, so look at the bottom trace. That was acquired when the person was in deep sleep. And there's one second time, that red bar. So that's one peak. To another peak, that's one cycle. That's a second cycle. So two cycles per second. Big, slow waves, and that's an indication that the cortex is not very active. Let's look at this next, next trace. This was recorded when someone was drowsy. And so again, we can count the number of cycles peak to peak within that one second time. So there's one peak, second peak, two cycles, three cycles, four, four and a half cycles per second. What that's telling you is that, that at that moment, the cortex is a little bit more activated than, than the one below, than the two below. Okay, that trace is, is showing alpha. Alpha is the brain wave that appears when the brain is resting, but ready to go to work. And I won't bother counting, but what I can tell you is there are nine cycles in that second right there that the, right beneath the red bar. At the top is a trace recorded when an individual is in an active, activated state. So it's an indication of more neuronal activity summed up and picked up by the electrode that's on the individual scalp, okay? So it's not that fancy, right, at this level. Big, slow waves mean cortex is not very active. Not so big, but still a little bigger than you expect. Drowsy. I'm working, I'm working. I'm information processing, okay? Now, what we know from lots and lots and lots of research now is that the EEG does matter for mental health. So an abnormal EEG has been found in research to be associated with various forms of dysfunction, including ADHD. So the FDA has approved a measure, an EEG measure, an index, as an aid or an assist to diagnosis of ADHD. There are lots of studies have shown 
uh, EEG abnormalities that are found with autism spectrum disorder and with, with depression and with PTSD. And increasingly there's, there are findings that are showing that you can see EEG markers that tell you which medication is most likely to be effective. So this signal that you're seeing, just these simple squiggles, actually tells us a whole lot about how the brain is working from the point of view of um, mental health. And this raises the, the promise, right, that if you can change the EEG problem, then maybe you can change the underlying problem that that EEG problem is associated with. And so that's the biggest premise of neurofeedback. So what the heck is neurofeedback anyhow? All we're doing is feeding back your EEG. We set targets or goals for change of that EEG. So for instance, someone with PTSD, the thing that we're most likely to see in their EEG before we even get started is excessive fast activity, excessive beta and excessive high beta, meaning that the brain is essentially overly activated, working too hard. And then there are frequencies that you see where there's not enough of them, like for instance, alpha. So that frequency that it was, is consistent with the brain being resting, but ready to work, you don't see much. And why is that? Because this is a brain where resting is, feels dangerous. So you record the EEG, Every half second, the software compares that EEG moment to the two goals that you set, right? And the two goals are less high beta, more alpha. We're trying to signal to the person, signal to the brain, when it's doing that thing that's going to lead to reduced hyperarousal symptoms. You get reinforcement or reward or a signal when both targets are met. So if that person makes more alpha and less high beta, the software says, cool, good, that's just what we want, thanks. And when that person doesn't, the computer, the software doesn't say anything. So now what's happening is you're getting markers for when you have been able to shift your EEG in the direction of reduced activation and increased um, quieting or calming in the brain. Okay, so here's a guy who's doing neurofeedback and he's got one sensor on his scalp there and another on his ear. There's a third that you can't see. That's the screen which is showing the EEG and showing the parts of the EEG that you're trying to train and that's the feedback. So he's playing Pac-Man but he doesn't have anything in his hands. He's playing Pac-Man with his brain. And the way Pac-Man works is so let's assume that he has PTSD and what, he's tr what we're trying to do is help his brain learn how to rest. And that means more alpha and less high beta. Every half second that there's enough alpha and less high beta, Pac-Man gobbles. When momentarily there's too little alpha or too much high beta, Pac-Man stops. Alpha again, Pac-Man goes, right? So it's just as simple as that. Pac-Man is moving in those half second intervals that you are meeting the, the targets for brain change. So monkeys can do it. Um, and this guy, he's a monkey and he's doing neurofeedback. Um, and so the monkey's EEG is over there that horizontal line is the target for increase. And so every time the signal goes above that line, that's a good thing. The other line is the target for decrease. And every time the signal falls below that mine line, that's also a good thing. So when both things happen at the same time, when there is less of the the frequency that you're trying to decrease and more of the frequency that you're trying to increase, a piece of popcorn falls from the heavens. <laughs> so we can watch. Okay, so while he's chewing, there's no feedback that's going to happen. But there he goes. So no, 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 not yet, not yet. You can do it, not yet. There you go. Okay, so now there's a pause while he's, he's appreciating his reward. 
He's looking at the experimenter. And here we go again. Not yet. Nope. Nope. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, pretty soon. Yep, there you go. Okay, so it's really just that simple. We don't use popcorn, although we have, with really young kids, used food rewards. Um, but typically the reward is good things happening on the screen. All right, so here are the data. Um, so each of the blocks shows the data from that session. These are 30-minute sessions. Each monkey is a different color. You can see that in the first session, there's not much learning for the first um, 15 minutes or so, but then you start to see some learning. In the second session, you can see clearer learning. You can see that the second, that Marmoset 2 was a little bit delayed in his getting it, but he then did get it. In sessions three, four, and five, very clear, very evident change. If monkeys can do it, so can we. And um, all I've shown you so far is how this works and what the data is about EEG change. Now there's also data about EEG change with humans. And so one study was asking the human subjects to decrease alpha. And this study actually, they used a sham control. So some people got real feedback, some people got fake feedback. In each case, the idea was to increase the amount of this frequency alpha that's associated with, excuse me, to decrease this frequency that's, that's associated with quieting. And what they found was that when you got real feedback, you could actually diminish alpha. And when you got fake feedback, you couldn't. So here's the data. The blue group is the group that got fake feedback. Pink group is the group that got real feedback. You can see that in the first, very first uh, period, three minute period, there's a significant de decrease for both groups. But over the course of the session, it's a 30 minute session, so each number at the bottom represents a three minute period. The sham group, the alpha, bounced right back up, and it was only in the real neurofeedback group that the alpha remained low. This is another, another study that looked um, at whether humans could increase alpha. And so what you can see is each, they show you the data within each session, so each of the small dots, and then across sessions. And what they found was, yes, with this kind of feedback, just simple, yep, you did it, no, you didn't, you can increase the amplitude or the amount of alpha in your EEG. You can also decrease theta. So this is actually comes from a study of working with kids on the autism spectrum. And so each line is representing one subject. And so you can see that at C3, which is in the left hemisphere, these subjects, autistic spectrum kiddos, were able to, de to decrease the amount of theta. Um, and you can also see that two individuals didn't change. So it doesn't always work. And the same thing in the right hemisphere. And in the same study, you can increase beta. So these are the kind of results that say that yes, when you get immediate feedback about the, your brain changing, combined with targets for change, you are able to change your EEG in a variety of directions. And then the question is, all right, does that actually get us anywhere? Does it lead to change? Is it gonna help us help the kids that we work with? And so what I wanna do now is go very quickly over the research on a whole range of kinds of problems to uh, summarize what we know about the efficacy of neurofeedback as a treatment for different kinds of disorders. I'm gonna leave out ADHD. Dr. Steiner is gonna talk about that, but I'll talk about the research on PTSD, neurofeedback as a treatment for PTSD, as a treatment for autism spectrum disorder, as a treatment for substance abuse and addiction, uh, for depression, anxiety, and brain injury and learning disabilities. Um, I stay pretty up to date in the literature, although in a couple of areas there may be a few more studies than I'm describing now because I haven't um, in the last couple of years been quite as um, careful to follow. But first, I want to talk about evidence-based practice. 
Um, and this is the definition of evidence-based practice given by the American Psychological Association. So it's the integration of the best available research with clinical expertise in the context of patient characteristics, culture, and preferences. That last line, I think, is very important um, because all too often the complexity of the formulation is ignored and what's left is something overly simple and over-restrictive. And this is actually, I think, most people's definition of evidence-based practice, which it means that you can offer only treatments that have shown ef efficacy in multiple large and randomized controlled trials, and everything else is experimental and shouldn't be done or recommended. That is a long way from what actually the definition is. And we actually, there is evidence about evidence. So for instance, in 2002, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, they did a meta-analysis on treatment outcomes. And they looked at 136 studies um, <clears throat> of 19 different treatments. And what they found is in only two of 19 did the results of less well-controlled studies, so observational studies or open trials, and in only two of 19 cases did the results of those studies differ from the results of the carefully controlled trials. So that at, at the very least, this suggests that it's not warranted to simply dismiss any results or data that come from less well-controlled trials. Um, un unquestionably, better controls are useful and necessary, and in the long run, we've got to do those. Um, but it's not warranted to simply d dismiss less, well less well-controlled trials. And, by the way, in terms of how medicine is practiced, this is actually not done. That is... Um, uh, another paper published in 2008 looked at the evidence base for joint cardiovascular practice guidelines issued by the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, and they looked at 2,700 practice uh, recommendations. And they found that only 11% of those were based on multiple randomized controlled trials. So using that simplified definition of evidence-based practice, that means that 89% of the procedures recommended by the American Col College of Cardiology are not evidence-based medicine. 41% were based on a single randomized trial or non-randomized studies. 48% were based on expert opinion or case studies. Now, to jump to the end, now, is that a good thing? No, that's not a good thing, and much more research needs to be done. But this research is incredibly expensive, very time-consuming. And uh, the question that I, I would raise to the insurance companies is, so is it the case that um, they're only covering 52% uh, of the uh, practices recommended by the American College of Ca Cardiology? No, of course not. They're funding of these 2,700 procedures. They're probably funding all of them. Still, I want to be clear. Overall, the research on the efficacy of neurofeedback is in its early stages, other than for ADHD. That most of the published studies are small and suffer other methodological weaknesses, and that in no area of application is there conclusive evidence of efficacy. The place where we're getting closest is in ADHD, and, and Naomi will tell you about that. All right. <clears throat> So I'm trying to thread the needle here. I want to be clear that overall the research base is um, not the world's strongest. I also want to be clear that that doesn't mean that you can simply dismiss it. Okay, so for neurofeedback as a treatment for PTSD, seven studies I'm aware of have been published. Two were randomized controlled trials. Uh, both of the randomized controlled trials were comparisons to treatment as usual. Two open trials were done with children. All the studies showed significant reductions in symptoms. And I want to say a little bit more about one of them published last year in, or in 2016 in PLOS One. This was done by the Trauma Center up in Brookline, uh, Massachusetts. 52 subjects were in the study. They were randomized to either get treatment as usual 
and, and 24 sessions of neurofeedback. All of the subjects had chronic treatment-resistant PTSD. So most of these individuals have been in treatment for a good long while um, and, and not improved much. <clears throat> so they did 24 sessions of neurofeedback. After treatment, 16 of the 22 no longer met criteria for PTSD, whereas in the control group, only 7 of 22 no longer met criteria for PTSD, and statistically, this is a significant difference. There was a greater improvement in um, symptom severity, in PTSD symptom severity for the neurofeedback group compared to the treatment as usual group, and the effect size, so how much change there was uh, in this, these 24 sessions of neurofeedback was equivalent to that effect size that has been found in the best studied um, evidence-based treatments for um, PTSD. Our own clinical experience has been similar. We've worked, we've been doing neurofeedback for um, 17 years now. We've worked with lots of individuals with trauma, little guys like Tristan, um, lots of older folks as well. We offer free 20 sessions of neurofeedback free for any veteran with PTSD and have seen a fair number uh, of those folks. And our results have been similar um, using this in actual practice. It's one of the things that isn't often talked about uh, is sometimes talked about, which is the question of whether these carefully controlled, randomized controlled trials really match what happens in the real world. And that's a different measure. It's a concept called ecological validity. So do these things work in the real world? And so what I would say about this is our experience has been with neurofeedback that it does. <clears throat> okay, so neurofeedback as a treatment for autism spectrum disorder. Six published studies that, that I'm aware of, two were randomized controlled trials. Um, the controls were weightless controls, which is not the greatest control to have. All of these studies showed significant improvements either in one or more of these areas, and that's cognitive functioning using <laughs> neuropsychological tests. Uh, in two of the studies, social functioning, executive function, sensory processing. Uh, two of the studies did a follow-up 12 or 18 months after the neurofeedback ended and showed that on average these gains were maintained across those two time frames. Again, our experience is similar. We have worked with many, many kids on the autism spectrum. That was one of my specializations before I got into neurofeedback. Um, after a couple of years, we had a number of Brown students who wanted to work with us and be uh, research assistants, so I had them pull um, as many cases as they could find of kids on the autism spectrum uh, who we had treated. And so these results are a, uh, this is like a retrospective open trial study, no control group, but we're simply showing you what happened before and after on average, this is 45 kids. This measure is called the social responsiveness scale. It's a very widely used measure for diagnostic assessments and so on. Um, and again, same, same uh, system such that anything above 65 is considered abnormal. Anything between, anything below 60 is considered within normal limits. And you're seeing very s substantial average improvements uh, in these kids' lives. And I can tell you that not only do these numbers show it, but um, lots and lots of stories. For instance, one story that doesn't sound so good. One boy who <clears throat> did his 20 sessions, he was, I think, in second or third grade at recess most of the time, like many kids on the autism spectrum. He would have spent his time kind of aimlessly wandering around, actually f walking the perimeter of the playground. And uh, we were doing neurofeedback. We were getting really good reports from his mom. And then suddenly she said, oh, all of a sudden he's really aggressive during recess. So I said, okay, tell me about that. First, I got a little worried, to be honest. Then I said, well, tell me about that. Well, he's like pushing kids. He's like, you know, kicking kids. And so I asked her to describe what he did previously at recess. And he was completely on his own. Let me ask you, what do second grade boys do at recess? They do a fair amount of pushing and kicking, 
right? So he was actually getting more normal. <laughs> and that's incredibly important. And he, you know, recess is this disorganized, chaotic, noisy time that he was avoiding in every way he could previously, and now he inserted himself right in the middle of it. He didn't have the skills yet to manage that ideally, although to tell you the truth, what do are, what are the grown-ups always tell, tell kids when that happens? Tell the teacher, right? What do you call somebody who tells the teacher when something goes wrong? And does it promote, so does it promote being part of the club? No, not so much, okay. Neurofeedback as a treatment for substance use or addictive disorders. Here there are 11 studies published that I'm aware of. Four were randomized controlled trials. The rest were open trial observational studies. I want to tell you one in particular that it, what's interesting done by Bill Scott and David Kaiser. This is a pretty old study. You can see they looked at 120 mixed substance abusers. This is in an inpatient addiction treatment program. They did 40 to 50 sessions of neurofeedback for the experimental group and the control group where there was random assignment. The control group was simply got the um, treatment as usual for this inpatient treatment. The subjects were followed for a year. <clears throat> the one-year abstinence rate, so this is a very common simple measure of addiction treatment is, is what percentage of individuals are able to stay abstinent for one year. And um, what they found was that the rate was a whole lot better in the treatment group. They also looked at the MMPI, widely used measure of psychological functioning in a bunch of different dimensions, and they found um, that there were five out of 10 of those MMPI measures that were significantly improved for the uh, neurofeedback group. Here's the, here are the data. So, done. They're telling me I'm done. Okay. Um, can I have like two more minutes to rip through it? Okay. So there's also a little bit of research on depression, but not a whole lot. Um, we work often with people with depression and often find it to be helpful. There's a little bit of research about neurofeedback for treatment of anxiety. Here's where the research is weakest. Although, actually, in experience, we find it quite often helpful. A little bit of research also on neurofeedback for traumatic brain injuries. Um, small studies. Overall, the results are, are positive. You know, in all of these areas, I want to conclude by saying we need to do more research. Learning disabilities, here, here's where, unfortunately, the research is weak. Um, only, a, only a few open trial studies. Um, overall, the results were positive. One study looked at their effect size compared to other approaches to treatment or training for learning disabilities and found that the neurofeedback treatment effect was larger. I'm going to skip that. So big picture, I think this is a promising intervention that should not be left behind. We need to do much more research. There's very little in the way of adverse effects that are lasting as long as the treatment is done carefully. It's usually done adjunctive to other forms of treatment. There's substantial but not yet conclusive evidence of efficacy. Um, I think what I would say in summary is, yes, this is another good treatment option that should be considered in the context. Um, and I think it's warranted, and I personally be, believe it's, there's enough data that it should be covered by insurance when better studied methods fail. And by the way, that's a lot of the time. Um, but most insurance companies don't cover so that this is um, an, an, a useful, effective treatment option that's unavailable to the people who need it most. Um, so I'm delighted to speak to this group and um, of uh, very knowledgeable people, and thank you for absolutely fantastic introduction, uh, Larry. Um, so as a disclosure, I am disclosing that uh, I am a developmental and behavioral pediatrician at Boston Medical Center, Boston University. Um, but I'm also founder and CEO of Attention Tutoring, uh, which trains attention through neurofeedback. It trains organization executive function skills, and it trains relaxation uh, breathing to students and 
adults. So what I'm going to go through today with the remaining time that we do have, and uh, we will be available for questions uh, during the lunchtime, not that I want anybody to become hyperglycemic. Um, so just to keep that in mind, if, say, we do get very close to the end, I'm going to talk about um, a neurofeedback in children with ADHD with attention difficulties, and I'm going to go through a study that uh, we did in the schools um, which compared neurofeedback attention training to computer cognitive attention training. So I'll go through a little bit of that. I'll go through the current research. Um, I'll actually not be, de not be giving you a live demo, demo, but if you do go to my website, there is just, I think it's a three-minute demo um, of neurofeedback that you can see that's pretty uh, clear and also demonstrates just in a kind of short movie clip what Larry also explained, but I will be giving you pictures on this. Again, any questions about this, please come afterwards and we can, we can go through things. Um, so just to think a little bit about the traditional approach, I don't want to go into too much detail. I know this is a really sophisticated audience right now. Um, when we're looking at ADHD, the diagnosis really is um, medical, uh, which means to say that it's that doc, like myself, a developmental behavioral pediatrician, that makes the diagnosis. And I'm going to, as we move along what I'm going to be talking about, and for you guys in the schools or psychologists, this is kind of like a really big deal. Um, because sometimes it does mean to say that no diagnosis, no treatment. Um, but ideally, and what I really try to spend a lot of my life and time training people is that ADHD should be really a combined effort of not only the clinician, but also the parent and the teacher. And so we really need to be consulting with everybody and through questionnaires that I'm sure most of you have already dealt with. Uh, with joy. So the traditional approach is um, through the DSM now five is that we look at attention and hyperactivity impulsivity criteria. And then basically the traditional med the traditional approach is uh, medication uh, and or behavior therapy in the preschool kids. We start off with um, therapy with behavioral therapy approach. Um, but the reason why we're speaking today is that um, even though uh, children, there's a lot of focus on the stimulant medication, we, there are uh, limitations to stimulant medication. And it's, I prescribe stimulant medication. I'm one of these people who teach a lot of people how to use stimulant medication. Um, but there are limitations, and I think we need to be very conscious of these um, First of all, uh, stimulant medication might look as it's been successful um, on those questionnaires that everybody is filling out, but then parents will say, well, you know, I don't know, I, we, I don't really see any improvement. And that's, that's what we call the functional improvement. So not just how long can your kid uh, really focus, but how has this changed his life? That's very, very important. Um, we don't always see normalization of the behavior. And then going a little bit down the list, there's limited parent-teacher satisfaction. So even if, say, it looks as if uh, those questionnaires are getting better. In the end, the teacher is telling, well, I don't know, I don't know, really. Um, so it, it, real life really matters. That's what we're talking about. Um, and uh, also, I think that extremely importantly, the family problems or all those kind of educational, those huge educational problems that are going on at school, they're not necessarily addressed by stimulant medication. And also, some families just really don't want to try um, uh, medication. And um, so, for instance, at attention tutoring, around about 50% of the parents who do uh, approach us, their children um, do not have a diagnosis of ADHD. They know that their child has it. It's, it's been brought to their attention multiple times. Questionnaires have already been done, but they say, basically, I'm just not interested in going that route. I don't even mind if my child does get a diagnosis. He's doing academically okay-ish, but I want to like, kind of like really focus on um, other ways to help him. So this, I think, is really a huge, huge um, point, the last point of families who know that this is not a route that they would take. Um, so uh, what are we having a chat about right now? Um, I think that what the chat that we're having right now is about the progress which has happened in neuroscience, and I'm not going to review with you, but the, the whole thing because of yesterday we went through uh, brain plasticity and this really is a driving force which has kind of reignited all the kind of behavioral cognitive training. And it just makes so much more sense um, compared to 20 years ago, now that we know that the brain can learn and change. Um, and then parallel to that, we have the technology advances, which have made these huge EEG uh, biofeedback machines. The neurofeedback used to be huge. I mean, 
just like cases, every huge and very, very heavy equipment. And now we have these little EEG things that can be popped on the head and, and off you go. So when both of those come together, what we get now is what I would call a revolution and a revolution of opportunities, perhaps, too. And so I really encourage everybody to think about how can we start to be using this? Um, what happens when technology meets neuroscience? And a little bit feeding on uh, what Larry was saying about evidence base. What, you know, when can we start to think about these approaches um, to become practice, you know? And, and I'm you know, this is a huge discussion, but I'm happy to have a chat with folks afterwards too. Um, when does it fit into the traditional approaches? And I think that that last question is something, it doesn't need to be black or white. You know, we can merge too, as you're gonna be seeing with the results from the study that I'm gonna be presenting you right now. Um, so the study design that we, that we did um, was that we compared the, the efficacy of two computer-based attention training systems. So we hit, basically neurofeedback against cognitive attention training. And we did this in the schools. And our original goal when we were doing this was we're just going to teach kids to focus, right? That's going to be just, you know, just treat ADHD and just see what happens. Now, uh, Larry did go through um, uh, how neurofeedback works. I'm not going to get into this in great detail. Um, just to say that there are two major EEG protocols which are used in children with ADHD. And we used probably the one which is the most prevalently accepted as being a standard approach to help children with ADHD. So you see on the top, you, you, you guys are now pros, right? You know this is slow waves right up there. Those are the theta waves. And what we know from research done in children and adults with ADHD is that they have an increased amount of these theta drowsiness waves in, uh, in their cortical activation profile, okay? And the second um, uh, brain wave that we were picking up was the better waves. Now, the better waves, as you see here, are much more rapid, and these are your active thinking, concentration, alertness, and cognition waves, okay? And what we know from research is that the better waves are decreased in children with ADHD, okay? So this is not a good combo uh, if you're kind of drowsy and you can't switch your brain on, right? And you have to get things done at school. So for now... Um, for the educators and teachers, I mean, as I said, you're very learned and sophisticated, but you can think, oh, this kind of makes sense why Johnny takes much longer to get going in class, right? Why Johnny becomes tired. He's, his brain is tired to begin off with. So again, you know, thinking about real life is really important. So um, this is what it looks like, uh, the... the, the the system that we use, the neurofeedback system that we use, it's a simple bicycle helmet with uh, what we call a CZ. So it has uh, 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 electrodes reading those theta and beta waves that we talked about. And um, the kids just pop the helmet on and they, we, we adjust the, the strings and basically they're ready to go. And um, if you're wondering about, oh my goodness, did they want to put it on or did they not want to put it on? We have had to this day zero kids who have refused to put the helmet on. And we have had kids requesting, coming into the room saying, hey, can I do your helmet study? Um, and so, you know, when you're thinking about acceptability in the schools, that's pretty important in including in middle schools. Um, and so uh, really important. We've had, just in case for those who are thinking, no, no lice, um, we get asked that question sometimes too. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people ask that question. <laughs> so we clean everything off, sterilize and everything. Um, so this is a screenshot. And basically, as Larry went through it with, with uh, you know, it, one game is the same as the other. It's basically a representation of those brain waves that I was talking about. So as the theta waves decrease, as those beta waves go up, the orca goes down to the bottom of the sea, and the child sees real life how he or she is changing his brain waves. It's this ability to change the cortical activation that we have in our brains that we know now that we can do, okay? Um, and so basically, uh, they learn, like the monkeys, to get the orca down to the bottom of the sea. And as soon as they become distracted, what happens? Those better waves go down. The, it shifts and the orca goes back up. And the more they train, the better they get, the more difficult the system gets for them to bring the orca down. Uh, but also, the, it, the easier it is and the longer they're able to focus. So that what that means in real life at school is 
the easier it is for Johnny to start doing his work right and he can actually follow through and get to that point where he's starting to finish the work with less of those, you know, taps on the shoulders and get Johnny get going. And that's really a big deal at school, let alone for his self-esteem that he actually starts to realize that he can do it, right? And that opens a whole new world of opportunities that he starts to think for himself. So our second intervention uh, is a system which uses cognitive attention training. And here you see um, uh, they're basically interactive computer tasks. These are not regular video games. But I do want to point out these are not either the Alcali kind of like um, uh, multitasking video games. That's really a new trend right now. And so these, these are not that type of uh, video games which are, which are not yet even on the market. Um, but so this is, uh, this is a traditional cognitive attention training that you might have heard about. Um, and um, it gives immediate feedback. And the children basically, uh, they go from one level to the next. And they can get better at this. And so here you see that they, uh, they have to put together different um, they have to do different pairs, and if say they do it correctly, uh, the the computer says, "Oh, you are fabulous today," and then they move on to the next level. Um, so this is the study design that we had, and we enrolled 104 children. And just to give you um, a reference of that, that is considered a very large study. So this is really in a, a larger study um, in in this area of neurofeedback. And uh, we tested the children before. We separated them into three groups, as I was talking about, the neurofeedback group, the cognitive attention training group, and then the waitlist control group. And we, did, we tested them after the intervention, which I will explain. And then we had a look at them six months follow-up. And I just want you to understand that six-month follow-up was, in fact, the following school year. Okay, so that's really a big deal. We're talking about after those great summer vacations. <laughs> Okay, so uh, recruitment, this was done in the schools. So this is, uh, you know, what we call translational research, which is um, taking things from the lab into the school to see if, say, hey, can you actually do this kind of stuff in the school? Can you actually help people in real life? And so we did this in 19 elementary schools. Uh, and we did enroll, and this is very, very new, uh, children regardless of their medication status. <clears throat> and again, it's just to say, hey, we want to take everybody. Um, and there were some exclusion criteria, which um, you know we can talk about if, say, there is time later on. Um, so what was the intervention? We did uh, 45 minute sessions three times a week and um, for the folks as somebody's going oh wow no they're never going to let you do that well the reason was that actually I'd done studies before and I'd done it the, the two times per week which is kind of like the average that you might expect but uh, who are educators here Yes, quite a lot. So, you know, in real life, you know, in Massachusetts, we have the joy to have snow days, and then there are vacation days, and y you know that twice a week is just not going to happen, right? And so from the get-go, we did three times a week, aiming at having the three, two to three times a week. And you can do three times a week. You can do every day if you want to. I've actually done a study with children on the autism spectrum, which was positive, uh, and we did it uh, twice a day. So there are different versions that can happen. You know, you're training the brain. The brain is there. It's ready to, to move on and to be trained. So that's for the three times a week and the feasibility in the schools. And we did 40 sessions, which ended up being over five months, because uh, around five months. Um, and so these are the instruments. I'm not going to go into great detail, but just to point out, there is the BOSS, which is for the educators, behavioral observation of students in schools. This is kind of an important uh, thing for me to just tell you, is that um, this is considered the golden standard because it's what we call double-blinded, which means to say that uh, the trained research assistant went into the classroom, did not know if the, if the randomization group of the child, and the child did not know that they were being observed specifically. Okay, so this is like considered the absolute golden standard in any type of behavioral um, study that you can think of. And then we did the Connors, um, and then we looked at executive function and medication. So just to get to the results, what I want to say is that in general, um, this was well received in the schools. We did need to explain a little bit about what we were doing because clearly not everybody knows about these interventions. But in general, uh, it was well received. Um, here we have the demographics, but I just want to point out that what ended up was that we had fifty percent of our of our kids were actually on uh, medication. Um, and now, 
uh, you see that uh, we did maintain, our, our, we had very, very low dropout rate, we call it, from pre-intervention to post-intervention, and then even to six-month follow-up. And I think this is a proof in the pudding of how engaged parents and teachers and the schools were. They were part of this study. We were really embedded in the schools to the point that it could just have been that the research assistants were actually doing this um, within the school setting, talking with the teachers, trying to you know schedule those sessions and make it happen. Um, so I'm going to go through the results quickly for every group. And um, in, in a little summary, you will see that the neurofeedback group did significantly. They showed significant improvements and significantly better improvements than the cognitive attention group and the waitlist control group. So here, first for the pre to post, so immediately after the um, the, thera the, the neurofeedback was given, what you see here are significant gains on the BOSS, which is this golden standard observation scale in engagement and in the, the, the motor, the verbal, um, the off-task behavior, so they were less off-task. On the Connors, um, we saw also a significant improvement. Those little stars are good, by the way, they mean significant improvement. Um, and then uh, surprisingly to me, but with joy, we realized that there was further generalization of the skills into the executive function area. And this is extremely important. This is getting back to that, air, okay, function, 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 right? What can these kids actually do? And executive functions is shows you what the kids can actually do. Can they keep the time? Can they get organized? Uh, is, this is real life, right? And then uh, I'm going to show you now the slide of the after the six-month follow-up. So we're talking about the following school year. Did the kids lose the skills that they'd learned? Was their brain changed, and did they maintain those changes? And this is what we found. So I can tell you that in behavioral research, this is extremely rare to see sustained results to this extent. And when I did get these results, I did tell my research assistant, that might be too good to, good to be true. I mean, we were all so stunned that I said, you have to repeat the analysis. I thought that she took the same column and did it twice. So we redid absolutely everything. The same thing came back a second time, obviously, but you need to do what you've got to do, right? Um, and so we have sustained effect at the six-month follow-up, and this has been replicated in a two-year follow-up study too. And what we think is that the brain does change, and in fact, it's a little bit like the brain starts to know how it's supposed to function. And as the child continues to do tests, to do tasks, they continue to apply these cognitive skills to the extent that what we think is that they might even continue to improve. So this is really, really interesting and encouraging. So now for the cognitive attention training group. Remember, these were the kids who did the kind of learning video games. Um, and, well, not video games, but training the attention through just the, the computer um, games. And what we see is they did show some improvement. You know, there are a few little stars on there. Uh, but if say you're looking... Uh, compared to neurofeedback group, it's clearly not the same extent. And that's, that's important because, um, you know, I saw the educators were really concerned about time, right? We don't want to have kids outside of the classroom. That's just real life too. So we need to try to be thinking about which type of intervention do we get the best for, for, for the time where these kids are invested doing it. And just to show you, this is a weightless control because children do develop over time, right? So their brain, so yeah, hey, yes, they're gonna get better anyway because it's like six months, one year later, right? Well, here you see, well, they kind of didn't really get better. And this is really important because when you're thinking about situations like ADHD, we, we, that has to be linked with the word chronic, okay? If you don't do anything about it, it's not that the child is gonna wake up tomorrow and get better better. Even in studies that, that show some maturation, it's going to be very, very rare that all of a sudden this child is, is getting everything done. They are going to be, uh, it's still going to be really difficult for this child to get things done. So now the fancy growth model, which is kind of a statistical approach, uh, just to note that neurofeedback compared to the waitlist control did do significantly better on everything I showed you, all the, all the items, and that the cognitive attention training group you know, lagged behind significantly, only on one subscale. Um, I want to say a quick word about medication. Uh, you see that, that flat neurofeedback line? Um, that means to say that the children who were in this group did not increase their medication. In fact, some of them uh, decreased and stopped their medication. So I just want to, like, 
do one step back and tell you, for children to receive stimulant medication, they have to have regular visits with their pediatrician, and it goes something like this. How is Johnny paying attention? Oh, no, not so well. Okay, let's increase. And you expect an increase because the children are growing and the expectations at school are increasing too. So what you do expect is actually what happened in the cognitive attention training and in the weightless control equally is that they increase their medication by around about 10 milligrams of methylphenidate equivalent, so of Ritalin, Concert, or whatever it is. Um, so that's what you expect. So the flatlining already in and of itself is is the proof in the pudding, so to say, that something has really been happening that Johnny is able to function better. Because the parents then have to actively say, hey, I think that we don't need to increase the medication. Okay, so big deal. Uh, I, and here is just to summarize again, we did compare the 50% of kids who were on medication and the 50% who were not on medication. And what was very exciting for us was that both groups improved on their neuro, um, the, both of these groups uh, in the neurofeedback group improved to the same extent. So regardless of medication status, they improved the same extent. This is um, the first study that has actually looked at this. And to my knowledge, I think it is the only one still. But what it means to say clinically is drastically important. It means to say children, regardless of their medication status, can use neurofeedback and expect probably to see improvements. Okay, So very, very important as we go to transition to what, you, what it means clinically. Um, just before wrapping up, I just want to leave you with this quote from a college student. It is the first time I have been able to experience and understand what it means in the brain to have ADHD. This is what I was talking to you about. Kids, start, kids and adults start to think about how they're thinking. They start to be able to become more in control of how they're thinking and become control overall. And it's really very, very empowering. Um, so, yes, obviously more research needs to be done. We need to know the differences between kids who are um, on IEPs and have special needs. Um, SES status, there's a lot of work to be done as regards to educational outcomes, even though we did do some exploratory research and we uh, data um, analysis, and we found that there were improvements. Um, and we need to like start to shift to middle school, high schools, and I think even colleges. There are a lot of young adults out there who, who want help in this area. Uh, so just to put things into perspective in general, this research came and consolidated its findings of research that had been done before. It's not that uh, this research came and it was a single kind of study. And studies that have been done since then have also uh, moved along in this direction. So we're definitely moving along uh, in this way. I think that the improvement in executive function skills is very, very important. It goes back to the need of thinking of thinking in terms of how our children doing in real life and at school um, and looking beyond just the questionnaires. And um, I think that for the educators, it's very important too, because uh, do we really need a diagnosis? If we see that a child needs support um, and the parents do agree, um, why would we not move forward in this direction? Um, even um, towards thinking about ADHD and executive function deficits as a spectrum um, and moving away from uh, necessarily an absolute, uh, if you have the disorder, it's a yes for treatment or no for treatment. We need to send you to get assessments plural, uh, before we do anything. Um, this, I think, is very, very empowering because it places uh, clinicians and people who are accessible and available to help to say, I am seeing this child needs help. Let's move on. Um, and so um, I think that this area is really transforming the way that we think about how children function and also about how uh, we look at them in schools uh, as regards to what's the next step to be helping these children. And so obviously nothing help, nothing happens, just one person by themselves. And I say thank you to you for listening, but also thank you for everybody uh, behind this huge effort to make this happen. Um, and I'll take questions along with uh, Larry. Okay. So... So we're now entering the Q&A period, and I'm going to walk around and hand people with questions the microphone, because in order for our guests, who are part of the webinar, 
this will enable them to actually hear your questions. So you are now free to go without offending anyone because it is noon, but if you'd like to stay, our speakers are going to be here. So I'm going to pass the microphone to you, sir, first. Thank you. I'm curious, I guess this is for either or both of you, I'm curious about the actual computer experience and if that same experience could could be occurring in mass market video games if, if with kids self kind of um, implementing this kind of measure. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes, great. So uh, my response would be no, uh, because the two main things. First of all, uh, mass marketing video games, uh, they're not specifically training attention. So uh, the, the system that I showed you was there specifically to train attention. We're thinking uh, working memory here. We're thinking attention span. So it's specifically training to look at this, if you remember it, and then you're going to answer this question. Does that make sense? So it's, that's the type of video game. Second uh, connotation to that is that mass marketing video games actually do not train attention. Uh, they do exactly the opposite. The screen changes every second or or less than, than every second. And so actually this is one reason why we think that children with ADHD specifically like uh, these video games is that they have to put into zero attention span effort in order to flip, 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 flip. So in fact, they're flipping on a continuous basis. They are reducing the effort that a child has to do in order to follow them and they're interactive. And so there's actually a concern in the ADHD executive function field that uh, children who do have these type of difficulties can easily become addicted to these games. So big problem out there. And the only thing I would add to that is um, there is some research going on where both cognitive, neurocognitive attention training and neurofeedback are used at the same time together. So this is a technology developed by a company in, in uh, Canada. The, the neurocognitive training is called NeuroTracker. There's a big screen and you see there are 10, 10 spheres on the screen. Two of them light up for a few seconds to be the target, and then they all turn back to the same color and start moving on the screen. And you have to stay focused on the targets. So what they've done is combined this with neurofeedback, so you, you get hooked up, and if your theta to beta ratio starts to go up, you get a little beep, right, to signal you, you're, you're losing your attention, you're gonna lose those balls, dude keep it up there. So I think there is the, the possibility for really fruitful combinations of um, <coughs> neurocognitive video game-like challenges um, combined with neurofeedback. Good afternoon. What is the basic cost of the most basic equipment necessary to do this? And what is the level of training and expertise required to conduct the training? Yeah, I mean, so one of the huge weaknesses in the field is that there is really no formal academic training in provision of neurofeedback for clinicians. And so what do you, what do you officially need? Answer is nothing. In many states, biofeedback is not a, a controlled um, practice. Um, the, and there aren't really good ways to get s substantial, ongoing, rigorous training. It's a huge problem for the field. You can take a, a four-day workshop, and you know just enough to be dangerous. Um, you need lots of supervision and lots of workshops and um, lots of practice. Well, the you know you can buy really inexpensive equipment that's that's not so bad. We do a lot of home training with people. They train in the office and then we send them home. You can buy equipment that is in every respect adequate for $1,200. Um, and, and I do think that the training is equipment dependent. So we did, for this study, um, we did use a very standardized training, which is not very individualized, but yet, as you see, did give significant effects. And so I did train the research assistants and I've trained up to 40 plus people to, to do neurofeedback. And so it really depends on, on the sophistication of the system. Um, minimum? 
Well, oh, that is a huge, huge area that we could have a chat about for multiple, multiple. So I, that that's going to depend very, very closely to just you know, okay, what what your goals are as regards to the neurofeedback. So how individualized you want it to be, and that's just that's that's a little bit something that I would recommend that you do think about. Um, and uh, but the training does. You need to get enough training as regards to the level of sophistication of your equipment. But then again, depending on that, it might not be very, very difficult or challenging to get it done. And as I said, I do have a standardized training protocol that I do uh, with the research assistants and with the assistants who do deliver this. And it does not necessarily need to be extraordinarily complex. And again, the technology is improving rapidly, therefore making it easier and easier. So um, quick question about very low cost EEG systems and the proliferation of neurofeedback that is inevitably coming as EEG systems approach, approach you know, $100, $50, uh, very high quality systems, and the, also the processes of automation around um, algorithms to detect and then give appropriate feedback tied into automated software. Um, what is the appropriate path for uh, practitioners, for people using this at home, for companies developing this, developing this kind of stuff? to take this through um, clinical proof points um, and make sure that best practices are adhered to? That's a tough one. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, I think it's a great question. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think I can comment on the, um, the research question that you asked, right? How do you, how do you prove this is usable? And I don't think I'm, my answers are any different than how you prove it any other technology, any other time, any other treatment approach, any other time. I do have some concerns about you, you can get adverse effects from doing neurofeedback. Um, and it's safe as long as you don't repeat 40 sessions of something that's an adverse effect. But on the other hand, I have no doubt that if you did repeat something, for 40 half-hour sessions that had an adverse effect, it would be lasting just like Naomi showed. Um, and people actually have done that. So I, I got a phone call once from a mom who was in a panic because she had worked with a clinician in the office doing neurofeedback on her child who's autistic, and he did better. But she ran out of dough, and so she did training on her own, and she found somebody out on the web to supervise her. And 20 sessions later, she said he was even worse than when he started doing neurofeedback. So 20 sessions isn't that long. I said, well, stick your equipment in the closet. Don't touch your boy. Let him come back to him himself, and then we'll work together and see where we get. Mm -hmm. But the point is, there were significant adverse effects. And I have no doubt that um, with people who there are people who are more sensitive to neurofeedback and who are easily destabilized by neurofeedback. So we have had kids where we could only do five minutes. If we did more than five minutes, they didn't do well. So I guess I do have a concern about this getting um, so widespread and um, popular that it gets misused and therefore results are bad and therefore the whole field will be even more tarnished than it already is. Yeah, I think that brings to conclusion our session and um, I just wanted to say two things. One is that one of the implications of Naomi Steiner's work is that it can be taken into the school system. And if you think about it, this is an this gives us the ability to reach the children who most need this kind of intervention because the effort and the expense that are involved with taking a child into a clinic are something that is often beyond the reach of the children and families who are in the most desperate need for these services. And then the last thing I'd like to say is some of the statistics that I, that I talked about at the very beginning come from the National Center for Learning Disabilities, and we have here in the audience Sheldon Horwitz representing NCLD, which is an extraordinary um, organization really advocating for more money going into research, um, better information being available to parents, and is now undertaking a new initiative to try and get really effective tools into the hands of teachers who are faced with the problems of having learning disabled children in their classrooms and don't really feel fully equipped to deal with it. So thank you all very, very much for coming. You're welcome to approach any of us with the questions that you have over lunch. Thank you.